So I'm with Brian Lovell, who is the president of the Geological Society of London, where they're holding what really is the first focused meeting on this thing called the Anthropocene Epoch, whether it exists, and more importantly here, clearly, what it means. In other words, this idea of a, a, a moment on the Earth where humans have become a dominant or in, player. And it turns out that the uh, society had come out with a statement this past fall on climate change for the first time, and it involved getting consensus from a pretty tough and broad range of people who, who don't all feel the same about many aspects of this, this puzzle that we face. So uh, I'd love it if you, you could just lay out briefly what led to the statement, how you worked that out. The, the statement arises because within the last 10 years, we've been able to look at past episodes of global warming on a human time scale. And this is thanks to John Embry and Nick Shackleton, who in the last century worked out how to calibrate the geological time scale in thousands of years rather than millions of years. Until you can do that, there's no point really looking in the geological record for analogs because you can't relate them to what we're doing now. The key paper was published for me in November 1999 in Nature and that looked at a 55 million year old warming event. Now the beauty of looking at the rock record is you don't have to run a computer model about what's going to happen, you see the whole thing. And when you put, say, uh, uh, 2,000 gigatons or thereby of carbon into the atmosphere rapidly, a certain number of things happen. It gets hot, uh, the oceans get acid, they run short of oxygen, and as a result, quite a number of animals become extinct. And in the rock record, what you see subsequently is Obviously, the extinction event is recorded, and you see the drawdown over a period of 100, 200,000 years of the carbon from the atmosphere, which is manifested on the floor of the ocean as a development of a carbon-rich mudstone. A mudstone. So wait, that's like a shale or a slate? It's just a, a very fine-grained rock, it's just a stinking yeah. black mud laid down on the floor of the ocean. And uh, if... So the people who were saying to us, we're carrying out an experiment with Earth and we don't really know the outcome. Well, that sounds dramatic, but strictly speaking, it's not true. Earth itself has run the experiment several times, 183 million years ago, something very comparable. And the fascinating thing that seems to be emerging is as we look at these various timescales, uh, going and we look at the thousand year timescales going back to 183 million years, other past warming events where we get these black mudstones, we find that whatever the starting conditions, amazingly, you get the same outcome. Every time you pull this particular carbon trigger at a certain rate and dump it into the atmosphere, that's what you get. So, going back to the uh, Society's climate change statement, this evidence was beginning to build up, and we took the view that although our society is a mixture of academics and oil men, and some of us are a mixture, I'm a mixture of those two things myself, we're a professional body and we're a learned body, but we thought it was time for us to make a public statement about things that we agree as a group of geologists are established beyond reasonable doubt. And that's against the background where nobody in their right mind argues that we've already dumped several hundred gigatons of carbon into the atmosphere. That's observational science, that's fine. And we geologists are now saying, right, if you do that, here's what's going to happen. So, so you're making a geological argument that, we're, 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 that, that greenhouse-driven climate change is real. Uh, we're making a simple statement that all the geological evidence, and this is based on lots of different people going back and examining the same pieces of rock. We have this big advantage that we can't argue with the rock. We argue with each other. But if we can't resolve the argument, we go back and we look at the piece of rock again and then we work out the answer. Yes. And the answer, to repeat every time, seems to be, if you do this, if you keep on doing what we're doing now, we will repeat in all essential details a past warming event, at which stage geologists can take a really lofty view, which, unless you've got grandchildren, you tend to do, and you say, well, I've got 
we don't care, the earth will survive, it survived all these past events. I found my own experience was not only the uh, November 1999 article in Nature, but the arrival of the grandchildren. You tend to think this is a pretty bad legacy because we are now quite confident that it's unwise to go on doing what we're doing. And we're not putting it stronger than that. We're just saying we're not trying to set out the climatological arguments. We're not judging the merits or demerits of those. We're saying here's an independent line of argument. And I have to say that if I had to save my life by winning an, winning an argument with oil men in a bar in Midland, Texas on this topic, I would go in with some lumps of black mudstone from the ancient rock record. I'd go in with the established figures on our present input of carbon dioxide, and I'd say, which bit of this observational science do you guys quarrel with and why? We, we've had some dissenting voices, of course, um, but we have been at pains to draw this distinction between what we can say that we know about what we don't. Our code of conduct says, and I'm translating here broadly, if you don't know what you're talking about, shut up. Uh, it's a standard code of contact for a learning society. For anybody. Uh, profession for, for anybody. For a <laughs> professional society. We're, we're, we're a, a, a weird mixture in some people's eyes. We are two different things. We're the old learning society, which fuse with a professional society. So in our membership are the people who've been digging the coal out of the ground, pumping the oil and gas out of the ground, and I like to think the generation that's going to put it back again with carbon capture and storage. We're not being negative about this. I, I mean, I myself, when I'm going around talking in public about this, make two points on the strength of the rocks. One is the rock record tells us we've got a problem. We've got to stop doing what we're doing now or we're going to risk a repetition of these past events. The earth will be fine, we might not. And then cut the John the Baptist stuff with the audience, don't spell it out, just say, Here, here's what we've established beyond reasonable doubt, you guys think about it. And the second thing is, if like you, uh, you believe there's a cause for concern, we geologists uh, can do a lot to help. We can use all the skills we've developed in the oil industry in collaboration with our engineering buddies and we can put this stuff safely underground. If what you were to create an industry comparable in size to the present day oil industry and re-pump back underground the volume equivalent of the 300 million barrels of fluid we're bringing to the surface today, the oil plus the water, you'd crack something like three quarters of the Princeton target defined by um, Pakalan and Sokolo in 2004. Right. It's not going to happen, yeah. but we can contribute. Yeah. Was there a point in your own uh, evolution of your own thinking, you know, when you looked at climate models and the, sort of the atmospheric climatological evidence, were you doubtful or...? Uh... I was doubtful because I had um, uh, colleagues in Cambridge and elsewhere who uh, felt uh, that we didn't understand enough about the Earth system to model it and make confident predictions about the future. I, I don't know the answer to that. I'm, I'm, I, I, and for the purposes of the argument we're talking about here, the public argument, and it, and it is an argument, in a very particular way, I don't care. This is an independent. I think it's important that we, we as geologists are trying to establish an independent line of argument. So am I personally sympathetic towards the climatological evidence that something's changing? Yes. Um, do I think we understand all the causes of that? No, I think it's very tricky. Whenever I go to a meeting with my climate scientist buddies, I'm hearing that it's tricky. Uh, whereas the full cycle evidence that you and I are talking about here yeah. is a little bit different yeah. because this is a, a much broader, tougher, in a way more brutal scale. It's just saying you look at it over the full 200,000 year cycle, there's a, 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 an eerie repetition of events. This looks like a pretty substantial trigger that you pull on the planet and then you get this outcome. Okay. So it kind of, kind of sweeps away the detail for the public argument. Meanwhile, back in Cambridge and in these uh, rooms here in Burlington House, I and my buddies continue to argue about every last yeah, detail yeah. of it, which is, which is yeah. of course, the academic side of it and the fun. And, so, and by the way, on the, on the oil man front, it sounds like you're not just a 
doing a thought experiment about being in a bar with Texas uh, oil men. You've actually talked, yeah, talked well, to I've about. I've, um, I've 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 written this stuff up in several places, and uh, the the record is there. I um, I think it is really important that the oil industry plays a part in helping us solve this problem. I mean, Bob Sokolow has said to me, we can probably cope without the oil industry, but it'd be really nice if they would help. And I think in this respect, as far as the public argument goes, the fact that Shell has have now said, for them, the climate change debate is over, is very important. And Shell and other people are already taking carbon capture and storage very, very seriously. So I think there are a couple of stages to this. I think the level of conviction we need in the world's leaders before anybody actually does anything is just colossal. And I think we've got to use an exceptionally strong scientific argument. And I, 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 I like this geological argument. Obviously I do, but by experience I'm finding it's quite effective. I think we need to think about, we geologists need to think about how we can deploy it more effectively on the political sphere. The climate change statement by this society is just a step along the way. So one last question, and that's about the focus of this meeting today. When, when you hear the word uh, Anthropocene, what is, the, what is the vision that you come away with and, and the significance of it? I would like us to behave around the planet now in a way that makes it very tough to spot the Anthropocene in the future geological record. As another layer of mudstone? Sure. <laughs> and or... Yeah, uh, I mean the extinction. <clears throat> no, forget about our extinction. That won't be, that won't be uh, at all easy to spot in the geological record for obvious reasons. Uh, Quite a lot of the stuff that we're talking about today, which is uh, undoubtedly being caused by Homo sapiens, the preservation potential may not be too good. But the stinking black mudstone going down the floor of the world's oceans as it draws down thousands of gigatons of carbon out of the atmosphere, we'd see that in the future. And I think I was relieved to hear Paul Crutz in a conversation I had with him at lunch saying he thinks it's not too late. James Lovelock, from his latest writings, thinks it's too late. You know, I, I believe it's not too late, so what do we put in? Maybe a few hundred gigatons, maybe 500 gigatons? We can pull back. We've changed it. We'll put down a little bit of stinky black mudstone in the world's oceans, but maybe not enough for it to be a really distinctive new geological epoch. So you ask about Anthropocene, I hope we don't have to define it. <laughs>